Well, good morning, good morning, good morning. How are you? It's a lovely day. We're waiting for uh, snow. Certainly if you're a reader of the Daily Express, they have had a story forecasting a triple polar vortex for the last three weeks. And it's uh, the middle of January, traditionally the coldest part of the year. And um, it's forecast uh, seven to nine degrees, which is not, it's not altogether terrible temperature in the middle of the summer here. But uh, yeah, it's nice to see you. Let me just check the lens is clean and everything. That's a bit better. It might have a bit of condensation on the lens because the car's a bit cold. So, Angry, why are you making a video today, you might ask? Well, that's a good question. It's not that I miss making the videos. I don't, uh, I don't have a yearning to make a video every day. I do do, but I do would like to place on record, really, for myself. And I'm talking as someone who never, ever kept a diary but uh, has, has left uh, not just breadcrumbs but really great loaves of bread from my life all over mainly over my hard drive so that you know anyone wishing to should I in the unlikely event that I become famous <laughs> posthumously uh, anyone who wanted to uh, get an insight into my daily life would have no trouble at all if they had the contents of my hard drive uh, every meeting I've been to, every agenda has been scanned, every document I've ever written is on there. Every picture I've ever taken, every email I've ever sent or received. So, not that a human being would uh, digest this, but some artificial intelligence in a hundred years or so will, will be able to summarise someone's life from their hard drive in the same way as uh, they can summarize a short document now, you know, give you like a bracy of a short document. But um, my life is a short document really in the context of history. <coughs> anyway, I wanted to uh, put, put on record really, uh, turning points, I think is the best way to describe them. Turning points in history as seen by someone who's living through them and you know, may, may be able to spot them on a day-to-day -day basis. Because, uh, you know, if you were to put your, if you were to put your finger on like the rise of the Nazis or something in the in the 20th century, or, uh, you know, the start of the First World War, it'd be very difficult to, um, to look back and sort of put your finger on it. But um, it's interesting to think whether someone who was living through it would, would have been able to have spotted that point at the time. And the thing that's got me triggered, to use the phrase, which is the, uh, the end phrase of Generation Z, is that um, yesterday uh, the um, Sky News were interviewing an MP called Anna Subri, and she's a very uh, ardent pro Remainer. We've still We've got March, on March 29th, we're due to leave the European Union and we still have no uh, deal, uh, you know, no, no coherent trade deal with them or extension of terms or a modification or variation or novation of any of the terms. Everyone's playing hardball and um, the way the European Union likes to do all this negotiation is to uh, do it at the last minute. They do it literally, they stop the clock, you know, and then they work into the early hours and then they come out at four o'clock in the morning with an agreement and say that it was agreed the day before the deadline, etc. because the meeting was carried on past midnight, etc. So it was still yesterday and that, all these sort of shenanigans. And um, there's 20 something of them. They're all pretty well united in, the, in saying that the deal that's being offered is, is the only deal. And uh, and I can understand that, you know, they, they've been told that not to break ranks and say that uh, our deal is the only deal we're going to get and so we may as well accept it. So it's 27 to 1, which is exactly the sort of odds that we like. <laughs> I feel sorry for them. But, uh, anyway, back to Anna Subri. She's, um, she's very upset about the fact we're leaving the European Union and, and doesn't really accept the result and in the same way as a lot of people who voted to Remain never really accepted the result and carried on campaigning for a second referendum or a 
people's vote as they call it and uh, or a general election uh, or uh, the put the vote to parliament so the parliament can overturn the referendum which of course they're not they're not going to do or they'd all be hanging from lampposts by nine o'clock the next morning so um, the uh, Theresa May who's, who's one of a long line of MPs uh, PMs who's 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 made a right mess of things and then left you know before the effect of the, the devastation of their, <laughs> of their leadership has become apparent you know Gordon Brown sold all our gold and then and then resigned uh, David Cameron was forced by the emergence of UKIP into holding a referendum on EU membership which he then lost and so he then resigned left it Theresa May to, to do the negotiation which she's done really badly and has announced that she's not going to stand for the next election there's a whole about a whole succession of third division leaders for this country who've who've done things very badly and then and then got out of dodge before um, the you know it hit the fan and uh, so Subri was uh, being interviewed on College Green, which is a small strip of grass outside the House of Commons. And the, um, the mainstream media like College Green because it gives them the MP with the image of the House of Commons in the background. And, um, you know, and it gets, it's a little bit more, you know, when they say, oh, well, you know, there's trouble at the Channel Tunnel. And uh, now reporting from the Channel Tunnel is our reporter. And, you know, she's standing on some windswept cliff near near Dover or wherever and but it gives it like an immediacy it's like it's live live to the scene as if being on this cliff gives her any insight into what's going on you know any more than the newsroom would could get um, and so they report live from College Green and they used to get you, you can imagine that mainstream media reporting at ground level would would be subject to interference you know they would attract a crowd people would stand around they would try and listen to what was being said they would try and get into shot make bunny ears and stuff like that so what they did was they they constructed a raised platform which is an old trick that magicians use to make jumbo jets vanish and uh, what they've done is they've made the crowd vanish basically let me adjust the contrast on that oh that's much worse so the crowd now is below. So what happens is the crowd has reacted by putting placards on sticks and holding the sticks up. And I don't know, you know, probably the police to then argue that that's an offensive weapon and can take it off them. And um, anyway, uh, Subri was called a Nazi yesterday by by a, a bunch of chanting protesters and uh, a liar. And uh, you know the so the mainstream media have taken this attitude that this is this is outrageous and this is um, uh, you know should be investigated in case it's a criminal offense I'm not quite sure what criminal offense is being committed I'm calling calling someone a Nazi I don't think is a breach of the racial uh, race discrimination act or calling someone a liar calling an MP a liar I mean if that was a criminal offense then then uh, everyone in the country would be locked up so um, they've said they've taken the angle that she's a woman and that a woman shouldn't have to put up with this and while at the same time saying that women should be free to stand for Parliament and uh, join the army and uh, you know basically do anything they want uh, but they, they are not allowed to be if anyone shouts at a woman then that's a particular offence <laughs> apparently women can't handle being shouted at um, so they've got their knickers in a right twist over this Subri and the the reason why they are um, having trouble is because there's a basic uh, what's the word attention there's a tension between two opposing points of view and usually these opposing points of view one of them is eminently reasonable logical arguable and and sound and the other one is very well entrenched and um, possibly has as historical is is a is a an attitude that's been around for centuries 
and uh, is is accepted you know it's just accepted so and in this case uh, let me let me give you an example I mean the rights of animals versus religion there's a big uh, problem at the moment because on the one hand you've got people who want to uh, you've got uh, there's a religion that insists that animals are killed without any anesthesia or stunning by having their throats cut and being allowed to bleed to death and uh, lots and lots of people will only eat uh, meat that's been killed in this way and uh, it's got to the point where everyone's being forced to eat meat that has been killed in this way because if you're buying if you're buying your pies you've got a choice between buying pies that only half your customers will eat or hiding the fact that they have been the, 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 the animals have been killed in this way and selling pies that everyone almost everyone will accept providing they don't look into it too closely and people like me who are against animal cruelty and personally would not like to die by having my throat cut however skilled the person was who was cutting and however sharp the knife um, are, not, are not content to carry on eating pies made with meat that's been killed in this fashion so there you've got you can't have it both ways either you kill the meat humanely or or you know it's, it's either animal humanity to animals or, or religion it's one you have to choose one side or the other the two are not compatible if the religious people are not going to uh, eat meat that's been stunned and the animal rights people are not going to give up saying that just slitting cows throats and uh, sheep's throats and goat throats and that and is is uh, it's humane so in Belgium yesterday there was a uh, Belgium has, has finally said that killing meat in this way this halal way is uh, unconscionable and cruel and has, has banned it so what that means is in that particular part of Belgium no more animals will be killed by having their throats slit and it's a small victory because obviously all that means is that halal meat will be sourced elsewhere but it's it is a victory in my in my uh, opinion for common sense you know it's the the slit in the throat the historical been done for thousands of years uh, versus the uh, you know the right of other sentient beings to have a, a dignified death or at least not not to not to have a protracted death or a death of which they may be aware <coughs> so what has this got to do with Subri well you know we, we were brought up and I was brought up in this country to think that we have a freedom of speech I mean, I was. I genuinely did think we had the freedom of speech. And now what you get is you get now as soon as someone shouts at an MP, a woman MP, no less, um, you get this situation where people are saying, no, oh, this it should be banned. And they, they don't, uh, you know, freedom of speech, they never, they never use those words, freedom of speech. What they do is they say, well, you know, the, the debate should be conducted in a civilised manner or things should be done properly or uh, this is a, a public order offence you know peaceful and it should be peaceful there should be a peaceful protest by which they mean silent you know I mean peaceful used to mean no no pitchforks no flaming torches you know peaceful <laughs> meant no riot no no personal attacks whereas uh, now now peaceful means stand there preferably out of your camera and don't say anything now it's only a question of time really be before the protest has found a way of um, overcoming this their exclusion uh, because you've got it's very difficult to exclude a crowd if you're a director on the television and you're filming an event and there is a massive crowd there and they're ch all chanting the same thing and that thing is clearly audible you know that people at football matches have had this trouble race the racial taunts at football matches are 
legendary because it's very difficult to um, prosecute a crowd. You know, who started the taunt? Who started the racial abuse? There's a collective consciousness about the act that means that the entire crowd, for the most part, is culpable. And it, it's, it's impossible to deal with that. That's what the mob is, you know, what the will of the mob is, is you can't frustrate the will of, will of the mob uh, unless you've got the will of another mob, i.e. the police. So, um, I think it's, it's symptomatic of a deeper malaise. I think what's happening is that uh, the mainstream media is, is losing control of the battle, of the propaganda battle. And people now are not content to just receive their news from the BBC and possibly from ITN. They have many, many sources of news, you know. Everyone now has got a, a camera on their phone. So there are, they've shown instances of Anna Subri being, um, you know, effectively sort of doorstepped on her way to work. Um, and where some, some fat bloke with a South London accent is asking her why she's, you know, been so dishonest and why, and, and going on about her wafer thin majority and stuff like that. Well, how do you stop that? And do and should we stop it? Do we want to stop it? You know, is it not? Are, are people not free to talk to politicians when they're in public? What's going to happen is that the politicians now. I mean, bearing in mind that one woman politician was murdered uh, last year, and it's that's not um, that's not an everyday occurrence. I mean, that's obviously very rare, and um, and people are murdered all the time. You know. For various reasons, by various people in various uh, states of mental well-being, um, and so sooner or later, one of them was bound to be a politician. But the 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 trend is for uh, you know our 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 so-called elected representatives. They they are so uh, they are so loved and so well respected. They have to go around behind bulletproof glass. Uh, and it's similar to the royals, you know, everyone, we're told that everyone loves the, the dear old Queen and the dear old uh, Prince Charles and dear old everybody else. And we love them to the extent that they have to go everywhere in an armour-plated limousine. Um, so there's, there's, a, there's a contradiction there, isn't there? There's some, there's some tension between the establishment view that these people are well loved and the the actuality, which is that they, their schedules are secret, they're, um, they fly everywhere because it's more difficult to, um, you know, intercept them, set up a roadblock or whatever for a helicopter. Um, and uh, speaking as a pilot, these so-called purple flights, which are not a secret, anyone who's an aviator gets notified about purple flights. Um, and basically we're told to stay well away you know we're not even allowed to fly within within sight of anyone who's 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 a bit you know who's who's well loved <laughs> so, <laughs> but um you know people have got their own they've got other sources of information now people are they're getting their information from google news they're getting their information from i don't know yahoo facebook uh, Russia Today has got a big online presence and, and uh, you know, it's alleged. Whenever you see Russia Today on YouTube, it comes up to this. This uh, channel is funded in whole or part by the Russian government. And, uh, and you're like, yeah, that's right. And the BBC is funded in whole or in part by the British government. You know, it's not, that's not a big deal, I don't think, for people so much now. And whereas the BBC news is very, very neatly and sweetly packaged the Russia Today clips are very short two three minutes and they're actual raw footage so <clears throat> they know that um, you know their biggest weakness is that it's propaganda what they're doing is propaganda so what they do is they just take you directly to the news and just show you what's going on whether it's the yellow vest protests in Paris or whatever so so basically in in being forced to broadcast these shouts of Nazi and uh, liar 
during the Anna Subri interview, Sky is, is a mainstream media channel has been hijacked and they don't like that. The mainstream media does not like the fact that they're losing grip on the message. Um, you know, as, and I know everybody who's, you know, goes on about, oh, and people are going to wake up and they're going to see this and they're going to see that. I'm not going on about people waking up. I'm just saying that people are going to have more than two or three sources of news nowadays. And, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not just, uh, I'm not, I'm not discounting sources like Reddit either, or, uh, um, just, uh, email, you know, and end-to-end -end encrypted things like Signal. People are going to have various inputs from the news point of view and it's going to change it's going to change very much how people see things you know what their attitudes are you know in, in places like uh, Syria where you know we sort of we're like oh well, I'll leave that to the Foreign Office the Foreign Office knows why we're at war in Syria uh, and uh, now, now, um, you know, why we're at war with Syria? I mean, you can listen to people like Ron Paul in America on on what he thinks about why we're at, we are, as the U.S. and the U.K. are at war in Syria. And Ron Paul, now, you know, if you podcast is another big, big source of news, and Ron Paul can record a podcast, and it can be listen to within like two or three minutes anywhere in the world anyone who wants to hear what his take on stuff is is you know can, can get it delivered in real time so I think we're gonna have a far more highly educated public and there's but we're gonna have to resolve this tension between the mainstream media fighting to hang on to their monopoly on on the audience and uh, everybody else is everybody else's ability to reach the same audience and the audience's preferences in terms of their news sources which I think are changing you know not so much because people are used to watch the BBC and listen to Radio 4 are are stopping are switching but because they're dying um, people like I mean I am I am in terms of my behavior I'm probably a generation or two below my my age range, you know. I mean, I should, I, I should be listening to Radio Four, but, um, but I'm not. I'm probably one of the first of the generation that is not really going to be bothered about Radio Four as a news source, um, because it, it really isn't a news source anymore. It's not a source of actual of what's going on. It, it's a sort of a source of what the BBC and the government and the establishment would like you to think is going on. And I'm, I'm more than capable of deciding for myself what I think is going on. So, uh, so we'll see what happens as a result of the uh, Subri thing. You know, because the tighter they grip, the more things will slip between their fingers. I think it's a famous saying from Star Wars if not before all right it was nice to talk to you again anyway I hope you're well I'll uh, perhaps talk to you again bye